Rishi Sharma, uh, you do an outlook um, each year as it comes up. We now are looking forward into 2024, and you've gone through some of the major issues you think we'll face. And let's talk about two or three of those, starting with actually debt and deficit. We certainly have it in the United States. As you've gone through, we have it in other places, particularly in emerging markets as well. Give us your look on 2024 on, on deficits. Well, David, as you know, this is also a very big election year globally. Mm. Uh, with more than half the population or some estimate close to that going to the polls this year. And the issue is that typically in election years, the pressure on politicians is to spend a lot uh, because that's the way they try and buy votes uh, in a way. And that pressure is even more intense this year because the approval ratings of most politicians around the world is very low. And to try and win the election, the pressure will obviously be to spend even more. The problem here is the fact that the deficit levels, if you take countries such as the United States, are now far higher than anything that we have seen in the recent past. The U.S., for example, used to run a budget deficit of about 3 percent of GDP for much of the last two decades or so, on average. After the pandemic, that deficit shot up and now is likely to be at least 6 percent of GDP for the foreseeable future. So massive step function change that's taking place just in the United States. There are a few emerging markets, too, from Mexico to South Africa, where the deficit levels have jumped up, and they're all going to the polls this year. Another major development we've seen in the United States, but not just the United States, is immigration, and particularly undocumented immigration in the United States, which has really ramped up substantially. You point out, in some of the charts you have, that in fact, 2023, I believe, will be the first time we have more undocumented people coming to the country than documented. What sort of pressures does that put on the economy and ultimately on business? Well, firstly, the good news, which is that in 2023, the big story was inflation as we started out and labor shortages. This massive influx of immigrants that took place, not just in the United States, but also in much of the uh, Western world in Europe, that helped ease a lot of the labor shortages and that also helped take the edge of inflation because there was a big supply side shock that happened in terms of the number of immigrants that came and increased the labor supply. So that's the good thing. The negative, thing, the negative news here is obviously the political fallout of this, that these scenes that you see and, uh, you know, both from the left and the right, you get a lot of pressure. And I think that what we are seeing now is that the clampdown on immigration has started. And this could have adverse consequences in terms of the fact the same positive force that caused inflation to come down could now sort of turn into reverse because you have such a big clampdown happening because politically this is unacceptable. It disturbs the social fabric of a country. And uh, especially now, as I think that people have turned more inward, there's a rise in more nativist feelings. So I think that the consequences here are that this was the big economic surprise of 2023, immigrants coming in, easing labor shortages, easing inflation in turn, also raising consumer demand a bit. Now, if you clamp down too hard on that, maybe politically good, but economically, there are negative consequences to it. Another major issue for 2024 that you focused on is China and the path forward for China. It has been such an engine for growth globally for so long. It seems to be faltering a little bit right now. Uh, is it not any longer catching up with the United States in terms of nominal GDP? Yeah, so that's the point that I've made, which is that if you look at China, China's nominal GDP growth, really ever since the reform started in the late 1970s, almost every year was in double digits. Uh, the China's nominal GDP growth in the, in the 80s and 90s was close to 15, 20 percent a year. And now that nominal GDP growth rate has slowed to three and a half percent. So really, uh, we have to go back to the Mao era virtually to come up with years where nominal GDP growth in China was this low. And the United States, the nominal GDP growth is much higher currently than three and a half percent. So therefore, and especially with the Chinese currency depreciating and likely to depreciate even further from here, given the amount of stimulus that they need to do, what, what you're seeing here now is that the gap between U.S. and China in nominal dollar term, which is what really what people look at, even the Chinese policymakers secretly focus on, that gap was closing. The, China went from being a fraction of the U.S. economy in the 1970s to more than 70 percent of U.S. economic size by 2020. Last couple of years, that trend has begun to reverse itself. 
And the prediction that I've made, in fact, I, I also wrote about this over a year ago and I've been saying so for a while, is that it may be that in our lifetime, China never ever catches up to the United States given the demographic profile, given the debt profile. China just reported today that its population is shrinking again and is likely to keep falling by at least two or three million a year for the foreseeable future. So these are major headwinds that China has to encounter. So this is not just a growth engine just faltering a bit. This is a seminal change taking place in China. And besides uh, the, the population growth and what they've done with their economy, wh what about foreign direct investment? Because that's one of the things that really, really can propel an economy forward. Foreign direct investment in China has dropped off and is actually negative right now. Is that likely to turn around? And by the way, where is that money going? Yeah. So. I think that people are still in a mood, in general, global investors are still in a mood to de-risk from China. In fact, there are lots of people I know who would like to have less exposure to China than what they have today, but it takes a while to make these adjustments. Still, you can see where these flows are getting redirected, which are the countries where the share of global FDI is increasing, Mexico, Vietnam, uh, India even, and a lot of ASEAN countries too, like Indonesia. These are all countries where you're seeing FDI as a share of the overall economy increase. And so those are clearly the beneficiaries of the so-called China plus one strategy. And so that's what's the positive news here, that the world never comes to an end. It always evolves. And so the Chinese growth story of the last 30 to 40 years has ground to a halt. But there are new winners that are emerging outside of China.